Oh, shit. Um, yeah, there's a few caveats that may be involved. Wait, hold up. Yeah. So the first of all, make sure that you've already gone in and uh, ran this, actually this or this command. Um, if you run this command, it's just going to download it and start the Docker container. Oh, oh, oh. So make sure if you're using Docker that you've already ran this command right here. Go to the go to the directory that is um, that contains day 18 and just run it there. And then go to your terminal. And what you'll want to do is just paste it in. However, a lot of you are probably getting this error message right here, where it says error response from daemon whatever find uh, port already ad allocated. So that just basically means you've already started a cross container. So to, ba to counteract this, what you want to do is docker ps. And what you'll see at the very end here is the name, the image name. Now, this small screen doesn't really uh, give you the full like uh, column-wise output, but it should line up with this name column right here. So I've already renamed mine to cross, but so that's pretty convenient for me. Um, let me see, let me make sure I'm not losing anything. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to stop it. Uh, takes a second, I guess. And then, uh, conceivably, what I could do is just um, run this command again. Um, let me make sure I'm in the right directory I want to be. Bam. And then I can go to my local host 888 and it should work. Um, go to day 18. And as a test of sanity, I'm able to implement my cross stuff. Cool, works. So I'm actually going to stop this and um, actually, no, this works. This works. So yeah, but I'm going to start out with a slideshow. Oh, uh, let me. All right. Um, hopefully, we're good. Awesome. So, not having any problems. Cool, cool. So, today I'm going to be talking about Cross and convolutional neural networks. So, Keras is a deep learning library that makes making neural networks really, really easy. It's, a, it's incredibly great. It helps a lot with my work and the kind of research I do. And it has helped a lot of other people start up their deep learning projects really quickly. And then uh, convolutional neural networks are just a different form of, con of neural networks that have been the driving force behind why deep learning is really great right now, really hype, and like works really well for a lot of different kind of problems. So let's get started. So Keras is basically a uh, deep learning library, as I mentioned before. And the, the greatest win it has is its simplicity. So instead of focusing on like, building a neural network and making sure that every like, input matches every output, and um, things like subtle, subtleties, like com uh, programming the optimization and the loss function, all these like, little details that are, you, that are always involved in your deep learning process, handles it for you. You don't even have to worry about it. The only thing you need to do is just assign what uh, optimization you're using, what loss you're using, and then you're good. So uh, another great win is that it actually compiles down to TensorFlow or Theano, which kind of proposes like a really huge problem in the deep learning kind of framework field. So you, you're presented with maybe like six different leading options right now. There's Torch, Theano, TensorFlow, Cafe, and everything like that. And so choosing the right one is very difficult because they all of them are going to be racing to outcompete the other one. So at the current moment, TensorFlow is the leader, but we could probably see Theano eventually be the leader in the future. So with this in consideration, which one do we choose? Karas basically, you know, lets us choose both. So creating a neural network in Karas is fairly simple. All you, all you really need to do is define what kind of model you're using. So sequential just basically means we're going to have each layer come after the next one. I think another, another version is recursion. recursion. I haven't really uh, explored the recursion. Uh, sorry, not recursion. Uh, recurrence. I haven't really explored that part of Cross necessarily. 
However, um, it is an area you could potentially check out. For the purposes of these lectures, I'm going to only focus on the sequential. And so all you really need to do to add layers is just do this model.add. You see this dense layer right here? This is equivalent to a fully connected layer, basically the stuff I was teaching in the past two lectures. And then we just add an activation layer. So the same thing as adding the activation function across every single output. Pretty cool. And then uh, continue doing that. And then the last one, you probably want to output a softmax. Softmax is equivalent to the sigmoid function, but it just basically uh, gives every single possible value a probability. So it's regularized. That means every single, the entire output vector would just sum up to one. So let's say you have five possible outputs. You can expect any, they have all equal probabilities. You'd expect that each output would have like a 0.2 for that value. But if you have a really tra well-trained um, neural network, you would hope that the output would have uh, 0.999 in one, one of the outputs and then zeros in the, all the other ones. So that, that class is probably the most likely class for an output. And then you see at the very bottom right here, there's this model.compile. Basically, this is a, uh, the way to define your optimizer. So in this case, SGD is stochastic gradient descent, which I was talking about last lecture. And then there's a loss, mean squared error, which is effectively the difference between two vectors, two outputs. You can just consider it a metric to determine how bad you performed, I guess. Hey. On the second line, what's the dense thing? Oh, the dense, it's basically the definition for the fully connected layers. That's, that's really it. So um, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit more on that when I get to convolutional neural networks, because it, it provides a different kind of uh, layer called a convolution. So uh, you, you'll probably see the difference when I explain that a little bit more. All right, you can follow along if you'd like. I've uh, basically kind of added some boilerplate. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not right. Or I thought I added boilerplate. Oh, maybe I didn't. Um, yeah, let me... Let me find the boilerplate real quick. Uh, actually, let's see. Okay, cool. I guess I only had this in one place. So um, yeah, the basic boilerplate, you want to add in all of these imports right here. I've uh, added a bunch for these different convolutional stuff that I do actually layer, but the only two you need to worry about for this section are dense and activation. Again, dense is the fully connected layer. Activation is just a general placeholder for any activation function. You define it at the, at the time of writing. So right here, we are uh, pretty standard. And now we want to load the data set. I've, um, I've kept it simple. You kind of just use the t utilities I provided. And basically, we're just loading the MNIST data set. So um, since I did push all of the answers as well, I, I didn't realize that when I actually did that. What I, what I welcome you to do is just delete them after each, uh, after each title and just kind of follow along. So you can get, a, get an idea of how, how easy it is to really write a uh, neural network in cross. Uh, I guess we're still waiting for the, for the um, kernel right now. Let's restart it. OK, yeah, that works. So when we first import, we'll probably see this message that says um, in, uh, setting up TensorFlow or something of that sort. Let me close all these real quick. Did I just close it? I don't know where it went. Um, OK, yeah, there we go, using TensorFlow backend. So if we were using Theano instead, it'd probably say using Theano backend. And so yeah, now we're all set up. We're good to go. We load the data, which is just a standard MNIST. So it's all vectorized. Each, lay, each row is basically 784 elements uh, for each MNIST digit. Do our train t test split. As you'll notice, I also used a utils.train test split. And that's because this Docker container actually doesn't come with sklearn. Um, so using their train test split was a little bit out there. I didn't really want to install sklearn. So I just provided my own in the utils. You're welcome to just install sklearn on your, do on your Docker container. It's not really that hard. And so uh, now I want to actually get to making this model. So it's really simple. Again, as I mentioned before, we just have to define this model as sequential. We need to add a layer, a dense layer. So that's that you can consider that our um, input layer, I guess. 
And all we need to do is uh, define the inputs and the outputs. Because it is the first layer, we need to define the inputs. However, on preceding layers, you don't actually need to define any inputs because it'll just assume what, it, what the actual value should be. So now we can add the activation, which it, we just need to define what kind of activation we're using. So sigmoid works pretty well. Oops. Uh, and then now we want to add the last activation. Sorry, the last, uh, the last layer, the hidden layer, I mean the output layer. And then add the activation for that hidden layer, which we're going to use the softmax function again. And that's pretty good. We've defined the layer, we've defined all the different layers, and we're good to go. So now what we want to do is compile the, the network itself so that we get an understanding of the. Um, so yeah, we get an understanding of all the, the little bits and pieces to optimize as well as calculate the error here. So I said I defined the op the losses categorical cross entropy. I'm not going to go over what the, that exactly is, but it's just a method of determining how how far off your guess is. You're welcome to Google it afterwards. Um, and then I'm going to choose uh, what is it stochastic gradient descent as my optimizer. And then I want to define what metrics I use. And I choose accuracy. Um, not exactly sure what the what the extent of all the possible metrics are, but of course the Karas has some excellent documentation, so maybe we can check it out real quick. But I'm going to compile this first. Uh, we'll look back at the that part in a second. Ah, uh, never mind. I, I I welcome you to look into it to find some other op options for metrics, but really accuracy is the most important one for any kind of machine learning model, anyways. So let's train this model. It's as simple as every other SK learn model. Basically, you do you call a model.fit or classifier.fit, whatever you want to call it. We pass in our X train data and our Y train. So our features in X and our labels in Y. We define the number of epics we want to use. An epic is basically just the number of times you run through the entire data set and through the entire training data set. And then we want to define our batch size. So if you remember from last time, we could uh, choose the size of the batch we put into the standard, into the gradient descent algorithm. And so the uh, compromise we came up with between like importing the entire data set and uh, using a single point is mini batching. And it turns out empirically, through all the experiments we run, that batch size, choosing a batch size that's greater than one, typically works really well. So now we can start training. And Karas provides this really nice interface of what's actually happening on each training step. So on Epic 1, we run through this portion of the data set at first, calculates the loss here. It gives us an accuracy of uh, approximately 80% after the, after the first Epic. And uh, it just keeps doing that over each one. And you can see this really nice output. It gives you uh, the amount of time it takes to train. So you can maybe estimate whether you want to run some more Epics. And you can see how much time each one would take. You can see where, how it's progressing as it goes on. So maybe near the end of this, you'll kind of notice that it'll slow down in its accuracy, in its uh, increase in accuracy. So we could probably figure it out that we need to do some kind of other fudging of the parameters here to figure it, to actually make it better. And so at the very end, at the very end of these uh, this set of epics, we get an accuracy of 93.5% of on the training data. So what we'll want to do is actually evaluate how well it does on the testing data. That's why we split it apart. We want to know how well it would generalize. So um, for this step, let me check my notes. We basically just need to get our loss in metrics. So we just run this evaluate, pass in our test data and the test labels. And then we assign this batch size just to increase efficiency because running at batches is still a little bit faster. Um, and then what we want to do is get an idea of what the output looks like. So um, don't worry too much about what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of formatting what the output would look like. I break apart the loss in uh, matrix. OK, uh, I spelled that wrong, but works. And as you can see here on the test data, we have like about a 92.7% accuracy on the test data, and our loss is 0.26, whatever. So. Of course, the loss is greater, which means that we do slightly worse on the test set, but that's expected. We, we, we wouldn't expect to do better on the test set because we, we want it to 
it's going to inherently overfit slightly to the training set. Cool. And so with this, we can actually just classify it really easily. We can classify any value really pretty easily. We just apply this uh, dot predict classes. So I do this with the test set, again, batch size, and then you can also give a probability for each one. And so calculated, it's pretty quick. Uh, that took maybe two seconds total. And now I'm going to output the third index of what it looks like. So we predicted a one, and that very much looks like a handwritten one. Now, this network is, of course, in, in, um, is going to be prone to errors. So what I've done is just made a way to find those, those inaccuracies. So as you guess, the first one is probably a, uh, I mean, the first one is this five right here. So the network classified it as a nine, but clearly it is a five. However, you could probably guess why the network thought it was a nine. Uh, the looping here may get it a little bit confused. Maybe this downward angle here w is captured by the network somehow as being a feature, a key feature of a nine. So clearly we need some more testing, I mean, some more training to actually get to, this va to the proper value here. And we could just do that through the number of epics we, we perform. And uh, with a network structure like this, it's been shown that you can get something in the order of like 97 to 98% accuracy anyways. We can also change up one other thing. We can change up how we learn our stochastic gradient descent. So we can create this thing called a learning rate schedule. And it's basically where you uh, decrease the learning rate as you go on. And that's because at, um, at areas that are closer to the minimum of, a, of this error surface we, you're traveling when you, you apply gradient descent, you'll eventually start bouncing around too much. You'll basically take your, let's say this is a two-dimensional case, you'll basically be jumping around kind of like this. And so what learning rate decay does, it basically turns down how far you jump when you get to a certain point. So instead of making big jumps like this, maybe you'll make a big jump, maybe you'll make like a slightly shorter jump. So from here to uh, something like here, and then you can expect it to go down even further, and hopefully you get closer to the minimum there. So uh, just to kind of show you what, ha what is happening here, I can make my own stochastic gradient descent set and then um, I'm actually going to set a value called momentum. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, there's another thing called momentum, which basically takes the gradient that you have, you've calculated beforehand with your previous batch, and it just gives it some certain value of leftover. So it's like saying, like, reuse this gradient, this direction I've had before, and kind of add that into the current direction I've been choosing. So this one um, seems to work really well. Let me think. Uh, let me get that learning rate decay. So decay equals, um, I'm going to set this to something like 1 e negative 3 or something like that. So not entirely sure if this will actually do better. I know that if you just keep momentum on its own, it'll do pretty well. But um, yeah, we can just let that run for now. So oh, yeah, the, here's a part that I um, wanted to go through again. So we can just keep evaluating these other parts while we wait for that other. Ah, oh, damn, I didn't think about that. Never mind, this will, this will take a second. So as you can see already, it's already it's pretty much outcompeted the original network that we started out with. It has a 94% um, accuracy on the third epic and 95% on the fourth one. So we could probably expect like something like 96% by the end. Awesome, and then maybe we can evaluate our accuracy. And we get, yeah, 95%. And that was in the same number of epics. So clearly, we have all these different parameters we can tune so that we can make our network that much better. Um, yeah, if you have more questions about that, ask them now. Otherwise, uh, I'll definitely spend your time playing around with this and kind of getting an, getting an intuition on what's good, what works well, and what stuff isn't necessarily as good. Cool. Uh, yeah, let's get back to this presentation. So now that I've introduced Cross, it's time to really dive into what deep learning is. And deep learning is stems entirely from convolutional neural networks right now. So what is a convolutional neural network with respect to the stuff we've learned? So what, you've learned, what we've learned is called a fully connected neural network. And that's represented by the dense layers in Cross. Basically, we have all of the connections, all of the inputs, all of the neurons from the inputs connected to all of the neurons in the first hidden layer, all of the neurons from the first hidden layer connected to all of the neurons in the second hidden layer, and all of the neurons in the second hidden layer connected to the very last one. Now, this works really great for a lot of different problems, 
And it's not, too, it's not too computationally complex to solve in these kind of small cases. Like in this case, we have 32 weights. So like, that's not bad. We can foreseeably see our computer solving this fairly easily and fairly quickly. So yeah, not, not a problem. Even if we're dealing with data sets like MNIST, which um, the dimensionality of the, pro the, the, pro the problem is higher. It's, uh, the input is going to be 784, input, uh, 784 neurons. And um, for the model that I ran with uh, Karas, we had, an, we had a hidden layer of size 800 and an output of size 10. So 10, one for each, out, one for each digit. And even though this adds up to something high like 630,000 630, weights, it's not too bad actually. Like our computers can solve this problem in something like solve a single run through in like, um, what, like one fifth of a second or something like that. So training one of these, as you saw with the Karas implementation, takes like, um, I don't know, maybe a, a, a minute if it's well optimized, if like the actual process is well optimized, which TensorFlow and Karas do for us, fortunately. So yeah, it's pretty good. Now, this comes with a problem where we, saw, we want to deal with higher dimensional data. And you may be thinking like, oh, what, what kind of higher dimensional data could we be dealing with? And this is where the place of images comes in, kind of the domain of images. So let's say we want to build a neural network that classifies dogs versus cats. You think this would be pretty simple. We've kind of given all the tools here. But there's a problem. These pictures of dogs and cats are both 300 by 300 pixels. Now, to feed those in as a vectorized form of themselves, that would be 90,000 inputs, 90,000 dimensional vector that you have to input into your neural network. This is huge. This means that if we wanted to create a network that's similar to the MNIST, where the hidden layer is basically the same size or slightly bigger than the input, we now have to deal with something in the order of 8 billion weights. Like, that's crazy. On a conventional computer that can do like uh, 3 gigahertz operations per second, this would take uh, several seconds to run a single run through. And that's lower bound. That's basically like, this that's as fast as we can possibly get it. And we imagine that there's a bunch of other operations that would scale this up even higher. So it's probably some constant factor, constant factor times this three seconds. It's incredibly high. Furthermore, we're dealing with the vectorized version of these images. Basically, we take them, we convert them to a vector, and we lose this spatial representation that is presented with the single image. We basically take the single rows or the single columns, doesn't really matter what we choose, and we just stack them on top of each other. So what happens with the representation of the eyes? You don't really know that they're next to each other now that you have them in this huge vector. Maybe you can calculate it backwards, but the neural network doesn't see that. The neural network only sees this huge dimensional vector. So it's like, why, why do we do this? Why do we remove this extra information that we have from this two-dimensional image? And you know, they don't even know where they exist anymore. So clearly, there's some problems. We, have, we need a lot of parameters to attack large dimensional problems. And we lose a lot of spatial representation. So what do we have to do? That's where convolutional layers come in. Basically, they allow us to preserve the inherent spatial structure of an image by doing the special operation called a convolution. As you can see here, this is the um, this is one of the earliest convolutional neural network architectures proposed, or at least by one of the um, earliest innovators of deep neural networks, uh, the guy named um, Yan LeCun. So this is his uh, MNIST digit, or actually handwritten digit, or not, not, not handwritten, um, sorry, handwritten letter recognizer. So the basic idea of the convolution is that you scan over an image with a weight vector, weight matrix. You apply a dot product at each point that it applies. And then you add those up into what is called an output volume. You can think of that as just a collection of these different the dot products added up together. So in this case, you can see that it hits about nine different points on the image. So uh, top left, center, and right, and so on through three times throughout the image. So that would create an output volume of uh, three by three for this particular convolution. Um, does anybody have any questions with this? Yeah. So Like, what is the size for each uh, like, 
I'll, let me return to that in a second when I really outline the entire convolution stuff, and then yeah, I'll, I'll show you what it is. Um, let me make sure. Cool. So the key features are, uh, in addition to this like single convolution, we actually apply many different filters for this convolution. Oh, each each of these matrices that we apply over the entire image. Are called a convolution. Or call, sorry, are called a filter. They're also called kernels. I'm going to switch between the terminology when I go into the cross implementation. But they're basically just different ways to scan the image. They're just different um, values that are contained in the, these kind of matrices that are scanned over and apply, and they apply this dot product throughout. So what you should know is that the output is therefore not flat. It's basically going to be a three-dimensional object in in representation. You can think of that as like a three-dimensional array in that case. So b that's because we're applying these different filters and then they, then they project onto this output, this slice, this different slice of the output volume. You can think of it like that. What you should also know is that a typical image is actually not flat. The typical colored image has three different channels, red, glue, and red, green, and blue. And so therefore, we're already dealing with data that is, exists in this three-dimensional matrix structure. So it's, uh, what we do to compensate for this is that our filters are actually full depth. They basically go all the way through. So in the first input layer for a convolutional neural network, you can think of filters as having some x by y size, and then they have a depth equal to 3 because they're, they're scanning through the entire depth. And let's say for that layer, we run like 10 filters. So that means our output volume is now whatever the resultant image is uh, dimensions plus like, or it times the number of filters. So it'd be 10 by a width times height of whatever the output would be. And then the next convolutional layer would basically do the same thing, except for its filters would be of length 10, of depth 10, my bad. And you could conceivably just keep stacking those on. So, so yeah, I'm just going to show you a demo from this uh, Stanford course that I did actually reference in the, um, the appendix of this presentation. I'll also be uploading it to Piazza in the same neural network post. So let me find it. I've actually grabbed the original convolution image from there. So as you can see here, we see the same operation. But now we have two different filters that are acting on these uh, input volumes. So you can think of this, this right here as the red part of the image. This part is the green part of the image. And this is the blue part of the image. We have uh, filters corresponding for each different part of the image. So this is like filter for this uh, modifies the red part, this modifies the green part, this modifies the blue part, same with this layer right here. And so we get an output volume of depth 2 and 3 by 3 because of how many places we actually run the um, convolutional filter. So you may be wondering what these different step sizes are. Basically, why is it not like uh, iterating here, 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 and here? And that's, a, that's a hyperparameter that we modify called a stride. Basically, the number of steps you take every time you pass through. And um, additionally, the size of these filters is yet another hyperparameter that we can modify. So you would typically choose these by running cross-validation, exploring like a wide range of possible options, and just seeing which one um, ends up being the best. So yeah. Any questions on that? Yeah. So uh, how do you come out with the filters themselves? Because that's usually a problem. Oh, with, with the exact filters? that we, yeah. You mean like the, the size of the filters? or uh, um, Just like the, the 1, negative 1, 0, like the, the filter itself. Well, we just use we just use our typical uh, our solution gradient descent. That's it. Yeah. So and that's the that's the great thing about this. So as as to your question about like the size of the um, the number of layers that you're dealing with now, or the number of weights that you're dealing with now. So if you count here, this is a seven by seven. So this would be like forty nine input. Let's say if in the fully connected paradigm, and we want to probably connect it to something that's like fifty dimensional, like hidden layer or something like that. Let's say just. Per, for an example. So now you have to deal with a 49 by 50 output, uh, 49 by 50 matrix, which is uh, what, 2,500 parameters in that weight alone. And then you probably, let's say you have just one more layer that goes straight to output and your output is 10 dimensional. Now you have to deal with another 500 uh, parameters. So now you're dealing with 3,000 parameters in what is a simple network. In this case, let's say you have a, um, Let's say you have a just this kind of convolutional layer that goes straight to like an output, which, which is a fully connected layer. So this layer right here, you only have to deal with 9 by 6 um, 
nine by six weight parameters, that's 54. That's it for that one layer. And then if you want to convert that to a uh, output layer that's fully connected, you maybe have output to 10, right? So you do 54 to 10, 540 plus uh, the 54 that are in this first layer, you have 600 parameters. You basically reduced the number of parameters you have by six, like you've divided by six. So that's really awesome. But you also get this added information of spatial representation. So it's just two, it's two separate wins for the price of one. Now I'd also like to note in the dog and classifying what, whether uh, an animal is a cat or a dog is um, it's slightly problematic to actually try to classify with a single layer. And you will actually need many, many layers to properly do that. So clearly using a fully connected neuro, uh, network is going to be really, really expensive. It's going to be way, way higher than 8 billion units because you're going to need many, many different layers. It's basically infeasible to use a fully connected layer, fully connected uh, network to actually do this operation. So yeah, there's some key insights you should actually, let me go to this slide first. So this, uh, there's also this other structure in convolutional neural networks called the pooling layer. They're basically a way to sum up all these different values. All right, I guess sum is not the right word, but really like take a summary operation on these uh, filtered areas of the like convolutional layer and just kind of down, down sample. Now you may be thinking like, oh, we're dealing with images. Why would we want to down sample? We're losing a lot of information. Well, what this is doing is it's encouraging gradient descent to kind of just bin itself. Basically say like, learn this number of features or learn something around this number of features. So it ensures that gradient descent is actually learning some higher order features involved. And so when I say a summary operation, I mean something that will take the, all the data and give like some value from that. So some of the operations that have been used before are sums. Basically, you just add up all the values there. Then you put that into the output volume here. Oh, wait, output volume here. Or you could just take the maximum, which is actually what this diagram is doing. And it will uh, just give you the maximum across each uh, different filter area. So to get, explain this a little bit more in depth, you can imagine these different colors as the different places where the filter, the max pool filter is applied. Um, you basically apply one to this red area, and it gives you the max of this uh, quadrant up here, six, and then max of this green quadrant right here for this right uh, square here, that's eight, and so on. Not too bad, not too bad. And as I mentioned, it downsamples the image and bins the feature. So now uh, I want to kind of step into what the uh, intuition is of what's happening with the convolutional layers. So. In the first layer that you would probably encounter, what happens is it'll learn these, these filters that are kind of like edges and different gradients across the entire image. So here, maybe it learns like edges that are like at approximately 30 degrees or something like that angle. This one learns uh, at something at like 60 degrees, uh, 180, and so on. There's just different possible values. This filter maybe learns like some kind of bright spot from the sun. Same with this one, some kind of different aspect of it. But as you see, they have kind of their own unique encoding of what's happening here. So then what happens at the mid-level feature is you get a little bit more detail here. Um, I'm not sure how well you can tell what's going on here, but you get a little bit more lines. Textures are kind of showing up, but it's still, it's still a little jumbly. You're not really sure what's happening. Um, maybe there's some circles and stuff like that. But what's really cool and what makes a lot of new neural network discoveries like very feasible, is stuff like artistic style transfer, if you've seen anything like that before. I will be talking about that on Monday a little bit. Um, you can see that there's, you're learning like higher order features, like the actual content of an image. If you can see this one, there's like a honeycomb showing up. There's kind of like a bird with a beak here. There's maybe like an eye here. And so this is, this is basically learned some really higher order structures inside of the network, inside of the data set that you've been feeding into this network. Uh, does anybody have any questions with respect to that? All right. Um, just as you know, just for your information, they actually were able to figure these out by just uh, determining how much, where, or sorry, I should say, what images would make the filter activate the most. And when I mean activate, I mean like produce the highest value. So basically they would run gradient descent on the like filter itself. They wouldn't adjust the network parameters. They would just take in a white noise image and they just run gradient descent until it maximized that certain filter output. So yeah which introduces a lot of cool different techniques you can do with that as well. So yeah, putting this all together, uh, back to this image from Lynette. 
So we have this input right here. We take scans of that. We put it into our first feature mapping right here. And then you notice the subsampling section right here. This would be equivalent to like a max pooling, maybe an average pooling, some kind of pooling operation that does this subsampling. Now we deal with this next layer of convolutions after we've subs subsampled. And uh, we just continue on. Eventually, we want to get to a point where we have very small maps, very small feature maps. And we will downsample that down to full connections. So this is where like the key classification goes on. So we've gone from, we've encoded all the spatial representation into basically a single vector that we can now just run typical fully connected networks on. And the great thing is they're like pretty low dimensional. I think this one right here is like 120 input. This one is like 84 and 10. So conceivably the network architecture down here is probably like, um, uh, what, like 20,000 parameters, pretty manageable by a computer, which is awesome. So as of, as of last time, I have included a bunch of resources for you to really brush up and improve your uh, convolutional neural network knowledge. And uh, it's, it's definitely by people who are like re very smart and very good at explaining these different concepts. And I recommend that you go through them if you're very interested in this kind of idea. So um, the one I probably most recommend is this first one. And uh, you know, this recommendation goes down. So um, yeah, let's actually implement it. So right here, I have kind of the same idea. I load in my data, and now we want to initialize the model. So again, we want to use the sequential. Not much new there. Now we want to add a new layer, but instead of adding a dense layer, I'm going to be add, I'm going to add a um, I'm going to add a convolutional layer. So I take in the number of filters I want. So I'm going to use 32. These numbers I didn't um, make myself. I actually found them online. They're the ones that work really well with the MNIST data set. So um, oh, wait, let me see something. Then we want to put in the input shape, which I think should be oh, 28 by 28. That one. So we have to, we have to de define it as a, um, as a tensor as a uh, three-dimensional matrix. And then once we apply that, hopefully that worked, uh, model dot, we want to add a activation layer. And as I mentioned last time, there, there's a special type of activation function called the rectifier linear unit. So this is the um, kind of the maximum of zero and x. It's, uh, it's just empirically shown to do very well with the um, deep learning kind of problem set. And then we want to add, whoops, we want to add another convolution. Actually, I'll just copy this one. Oops. Oh, what? <laughs> All right, run Docker again. Um, so I'm going to use the same number of filters, but this time I'm going to use a smaller um, filter set. And this time we don't need to define an input shape because it's just going to figure it out for us which is nice. Add another ReLU layer. Ah, oh, stop this. Add another ReLU layer. And then um, now is where I add my max pooling. 2D pool size equals 2, 2. Model that add, drop out. So don't worry too much about what this concept is. It's um, it's kind of like an empirical thing that works really well with deep learning. I would recommend you read the some blog post about it. I'll post one on Piazza, uh, kind of giving a good detail of what it is. But I would recommend you get familiar with what convolutional neural networks are doing first before you start using this dropout technique. So um, and then this is the point where we basically convert the convolutional representation, this kind of like two-dimensional representation, into this dense, fully connected kind of framework. So we run this flatten layer, it basically just puts everything into a vector. We um, add a dense layer, add an activation. Actually, it's probably stay. Oh, no, no, no. And there's that. Add another dropout. But, um, let's see. Add an output layer. Uh, for 10 because of the 10 out 10 classes we have and then add a activation function that does softmax 
basically the proper output for a neural network. Again, normalize so that the sum is one. The sum of the output vectors, the sum of the output elements are one. And then finally, we want to compile all this. Uh, plus equals category. Oops, so worried about that. Um, there's an optimizer called Ada Delta. Don't worry about exactly what it's doing. It's effectively a uh, modification of the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact specifics of it, but I know that it works pretty similarly. And um, then we'll want to use a metrics. We want to define our metrics as well. And cool. So hopefully everything works. It'll spit out something if it doesn't. OK, I typed everything right. So now we want to do the typical fit stuff. Um, set our batch size to be 28, 128. And let's see it run. So I right, set it for 12. Oh, I right, set it for 10 apex. Um, one second. Let me do it for 12. Cool. So yeah, we can just let that run. Um, oh, I realized I didn't label these correctly. Awesome. And then, uh, as before, I'll just actually just copy this above. We can just, mod we can just accurate, uh, measure the accuracy by running this line. And, and this line. Cool. Well, so this is running for a long time. And that's because the, uh, the depth of the network is actually very not optimized for a um, typical computer. It's a little bit slow. As you saw before, like we could probably do about get about the same accuracy a little bit faster with a fully connected network. However, you'll see that we'll actually improve the accuracy significantly higher than with the uh, fully connected network. That's because it just has this extra spatial this spatial depth to provide more information about what the image is going, what is happening inside the image. Now, um, while this is training, I'm going to actually go over this example that I whipped up with the ImageNet challenge basically classifying whether what kind of animal we feed into a neural network. So uh, I've mentioned this ImageNet challenge a bunch. It's basically um, where you have a data set of images and you have labels for the specific images. And you want a classifier to determine what the image is representing. And so in recent years, they made these a little bit more complicated. I think typically they were like one word answers. But nowadays, they're like, uh, it's very, very complicated. So I've included this entire IPython notebook um, uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the repo. However, um, to run this on your computer, it's probably going to be really impractical. In reality, you probably need a GPU instance, GPU to actually run everything. And so what I did, I uh, started up a GPU instance on AWS. As you can see here, I have this crazy EC2 thing. So I'll be including a. Uh, a link to actually setting up your own kind of deep, uh, deep learning AMI thing as well in our in the repo. I'll put it up on Piazza as well, make an announcement. So you can do the same thing, kind of use Jupyter Notebooks over AWS. And so uh, as you can see here, there's like a crazy amount of network of layers here. That's it's deep learning to its finest. I think this is like 16. That's what VGG 16 stands for. So uh, yeah, I think it's 16 layers, a bunch of convolutions, a lot of max pooling, and then some dense to take it all out. So, yeah, I've already ran that. Hopefully this is still running. So the first thing I have is a picture of a cat that I want to classify as a cat. It's this one right here. And then a picture of a dog. Not bad. And now uh, what I do here, I run model.predict as before, and I pass in the cat. And then what I want, what, I, what this decode predictions does, it basically just goes through and figures out what this prediction is supposed to be. It basically maps the output vector of the network to whatever, um, to whatever representation this vector is supposed to be. So let's run that. And it gives this cat a probability of 63% probability of being a tabby, which I actually don't know cat breeds that well. That well. But maybe you can look it up. So they're they're pretty good. Like this looks that cat definitely kind of looks like a tabby cat. 
By the way, these are random images I found on the internet. This is not like from the ImageNet data set. So this is, it's, it's pretty good at generalizing to random uh, values here. But let's look at the other, the other predictions it has for this, um, this cat. Egyptian cat, so yeah, again, a cat, that's pretty cool. And it gives like a specific breed, probably looks pretty similar as well. Tiger cat, I imagine these stripes kind of give, give it that um, perspective. A radiator, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but as you as you know, it's a 0.3% probability. So it's like the accuracy on that uh, level means that it's like probably pretty low. I mean, sorry, that means that this guess is like really, really low. So it's like, yeah, it's probably not a radiator. And then links, which is kind of interesting that the links would be lower than a radiator, but still pretty pretty cool that it's able to distinguish this, a lynx for, of all things from a cat. I'm like, wow. So we can do the same with this dog. And um, it gets a Bernese mountain dog first. So again, don't really know this. Oh, just kidding, I already Googled it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, but that looks that looks like a the dog we got. So yeah, you can classify your dog your breed the breeds of your dog with just ImageNet. Um, let's see what else. It gets an Appenzeller. Maybe that's also very similar. Oh yeah, also has the same kind of coloration here. A little bit less likely to be this uh, dog, but let's uh, let's see. I guess yeah, fifteen percent accuracy. I mean fifteen percent probability. It's definitely pretty confident that this is a Bernese Mountain dog, which is good because it looks like one. Yeah. And then, I don't know what an Entel buckler is. But yeah, again, same coloration pattern. So that's really, that's really cool. You're still capturing a lot of these, like, these qualities of a dog and like color patterns that match up. And then this is where it kind of breaks down. Border collie is a little bit off. Still a dog, which is cool. But, oh, you can still see like where the, the coloration is coming from and so on. So let's return to this example that I was running here. And as you can already see, we've hit like epic uh, eight here and our accuracy is in the order of like 98%. So this model in particular can probably learn uh, to predict the MNIST um, data set to like 99.5% accuracy, which is absolutely amazing. It's um, at the level of com uh, competitive with humans. And so what what this means is that the people who actually commissioned this, this uh, challenge was the uh, US Post Office. And so what they would do with this kind of accuracy, they would, they would be able to actually predict like how accurate they were on each individual image that they get. So what they can do is they can automatically process like whatever, let's say the accuracy rate of the, the Post Office one is like 95% accurate or something like that. And they, they're able to process them and then 95% of the examples go through. 5% have some level of uncertainty that the the network is like, okay, like it, this could be a seven, this could be a one. They'll they'll just usually take that letter and they'll be like, okay, here here human, guess what? It, uh, figure out what this actually is, and then the human will probably fix it in the error there. So it just automates a lot of uh, a lot of the time that they needed to actually classify these letter problems. These basically classify these letters as like uh, going to one location or another. Cool. Any questions? I can maybe throw some other images here. Where is it getting the images from? Oh yeah, so this is the ImageNet data set. It's basically, somebody went onto Amazon Mechanical Turk in like 2009 or something like that, and they uploaded like, um, yeah, I, can, I can check for sure. Um, let's see. 100,000, yeah, I guess 100,000 images or so. And so um, it turns out when they were first making the first convolutional neural network that actually challenged AlexNet, they, they didn't have enough data to deal with. Like 100,000 uh, data points was not enough to actually classify it very confidently. So what they would do, they would apply some transformations to this data to actually general, to kind of add this level of noise that they wanted to remove from the network. So I think what they would do, they would uh, downsample it slightly, and then they would kind of shift the images slightly. So I think the images are typically like 300 by something uh, size. So what they did, they would uh, reduce it to 224 by 224, and then shift it slightly. So yeah, shift it around so you get this extra like spatial, uh, I guess, levels of accuracy. Or robustness to spatial movements and stuff like that. Um, now. It's important to note 
that these networks are still a victim to some other things called adversarial examples. Now this is, this is pretty much the lecture's over, but this is kind of a digression if you guys want to hear about it. There's this notion of um, what are like these, these images that trick networks. So let me see if I can pull up the image that I'm thinking of. Yeah, here you go. So this is from, I think it's Ian Goodfellow, I'm not entirely sure. But basically, using the same kind of network architecture that I was showing here, this guy was able to take the picture of a panda, which the network would guess at like 60% confidence. Pretty good, pretty good guess. And um, it would apply this kind of like noisy filter on top of it by like such a small amount that the visible image that results is literally indecipherable from this original one. Like, um, these may, you cannot tell the difference between these. However, when you feed this into the neural network itself, it'll look at it and it'll guess that it's a given with 99.3% confidence. Now, that's just scary. That's just like, well, how, how, what, what happens now? Like, are, is machine learning done for? And um, no, first of all, machine learning is gonna be around for a while, so we're, we're good. Uh, two, this is a very like rare example, but it does bring up a very good point of what we need to do to make networks better, to what like what direction we need to improve to actually make these uh, products products better products better. I'll raise an issue with self-driving cars though. A lot of the new technology behind self-driving cars is aiming to use computer vision, aiming to use basically convolutional neural networks to interpret the world. Now, let's say you have a stop sign. That's just a normal stop sign, or at least when you're driving around, it has a, you have a normal stop sign. But somebody goes through figures out the convolutional neural network that's running, like, let's say, Tesla's um, computer vision, and just basically does the same operation here, where it finds a noise value that would completely confuse this network into thinking it's something else. They, were, they would be able to increase the confidence of this, of this prediction to near 100% levels. Like, they basically, they basically ran gradient ascent to figure out what noise value would optimally confuse the network. So a malicious actor could do that, put it on a, put this like filter on top of a stop sign somehow that's completely indistinguishable and then just cause a lot of people to crash their cars. So clearly there are a lot of problems we need to solve before we can actually use these things in production. Maybe you can use like redundant systems that prevent this from happening. Um, one of the other techniques you can use is like literally train on these kind of adversarial examples. But of course you need something a little bit more robust because if you do create a network that's robust to these adversarial examples, people can still make more adversarial examples. There's actually literally a method to do this. That's what Ian uh, Goodfellow actually proposes here. This sign method thing, that's what he does. So that's an interesting area of research uh, that's open right now. It's um, definitely like would be a huge area to figure out and determine and get some cool publishing out of that. So as you see at the very end here, we get 98.5% accuracy. Now, um, I think the problem with that is because I use this two by two layer here. So maybe if I switch to three by three, it would work better. I'm not gonna run it though, because uh, for the sake of time. And uh, yeah, anybody have any questions about anything I've talked about now? Awesome. Well, that's pretty much it for me today. So next week I'm gonna go over just a bunch of different deep learning algorithms that are out there, kind of deep learning techniques that have come out recently, and really build up from all this convolutional stuff that I've been talking about today, as well as the neural network ideas that I was talking about before. All right. Thanks, guys.